Hey there YouTube, I'm Ikitsu, this is the Ikitsu Times, welcome to my channel, welcome to a little bit of Age of Wonders Planet Falls. So today we're going to be doing the overall Syndicate overview, and the reason I'm not doing every single secret technology is it feels very quickly very redundant to go over all of them when this group doesn't really necessarily bring a ton to them. So in any event, uh, we'll describe the ones that I haven't done videos for here uh, to a certain extent, but generally assume that if they aren't uh, being showcased, um, then they play the same as it, it was when I was playing the Vanguard, essentially. Uh, or maybe even less interesting than my version with the Vanguard. So in any event, uh, we're starting off with the Promethean. The Promethean's actually fairly decent for the Syndicate if you're going for an indentured heavy uh, sort of strategy. The reason is that the Purifier, by default, is an indentured unit. And this means you're not putting Cerebral Control Collars on them, giving them access to a full three sets of... Uh, um, mods that you're allowed to put on them instead of just the two if you don't incl include that cerebral control collar. Uh, this means that they can get all those mass buffs that are really really strong as well as three perks while being a stronger unit than the indentured in a certain way. They're pretty good at both long range battles with those long range artillery type strikes there but unfortunately their main go-to is a shotgun type weapon which is a bit short range making them very high damage but not necessarily the highest possible damage output because uh, the typical way the game works is if you're able to fire three shots generally speaking you're going to output more damage than anything at single shot but still the purifier with these guys is very good also that sort of indentured strategy uh, there are limits to how many you can really get a benefit from and having the access to their uh i guess defense tanks is pretty good for them um the mods don't necessarily go back and forth too too much but if you are gun lining it with a mix of the Aegis defense tanks as well as purifiers or indentured uh, standard indentured then having access to those strong early tier really inexpensive mods for defense plus two shields from the um scouting module is a great way to make these guys a little bit more beefy a little bit more durable without having to spend a ton of cash uh, or more realistically Cosmite. So I think that this is a pretty okay combination. I don't think it's necessarily one of the best ones, uh, but it is very, very decent. Um, it's also one of the ones that I, I would also say is pretty fun to play uh, as well. Next up is Heritor. Heritor runs into this problem with every faction, in my opinion, where they are very, very strong. I would say that Heritor is up there as one of the strongest uh, combinations out there, but that has very little to do with the Syndicate. It's simply the Heritor side of things taking over for it. You can mix Heritor units and use the Siphoner's abilities with a strong Syndicate unit, but you could also just mix it with a strong Heritor unit. It doesn't really matter which of those you choose to do. Either way is going to work perfectly fine. Uh, Syndicate does offer a little bit through their early game mods, but you're really hampered in this combination by the fact that the mods are so restrictive in what you're allowed to actually give them to. Many of the uh, Syndicate mods, you're only allowed to give them to very specific units, like there's a, a tech that's only for the Mirage, there's a tech that's only for the Wraith, there's a, a tech that's only for the Overseer. Uh, so they run into those sort of problems there. Um, I do think that uh, if they you get access to a really, really good indentured unit uh, early on, those can work well with Siphoners, and Siphoners can also be indentured, but I don't think that they benefit a ton from being indentured either. So um, it's one of those ones where this is really quite strong, um, but not necessarily the most interesting combination. Next up is Synthesis. This one is actually pretty okay. The reason is that Syndicate gains access to arc weapons. Um, I think there's more fun combinations that the uh, Vanguard are capable of doing with these guys, but actually the starting uh, hacker is probably the best version of it in the game here. Um, it pretty much does completely overtake your indentured as your primary combatants, being able to sort of fire for more damage as well as having the breach SMGs, which ignore a point of armor and a point of shields. Um, Investing sort of heavily into those uh, hacker mods and giving them really powerful stun chain modules makes them a just absolute uh, sort of game changer. Uh, other than that, though, the other units don't necessarily mesh too, too well with uh, what you're going to be doing for the most part. Um, you do get some benefit from the... Uh, oh, wow, I cannot remember the names of those... Um, your, your hacker units there, but uh, they're not necessarily going to work as well with Synthesis as they would maybe with some other uh, factions. And um, your indentured, while you are going to be getting good upgrades for them, you're going to be swapping them out for hackers as you sort of progress throughout the game there. So it's a little bit of a tricky uh, uh, 
combination to really pin down. Now you can go around this the other way though and take a lot of the uh, syndicate units and give them the mods from synthesis and those synthesis mods are really strong. Um, this isn't like Celestial where you're losing out on a lot of the benefits either. Uh, you can sort of just take an indentured strategy and still get a lot of benefit out of these synthesis mods. Uh, you don't have to go all the way with them if you don't want to, and you're going to end up with really, really sort of powerful unit combinations just uh, going through that sort of route. Um, the thing about synthesis is that no matter what you're playing, there's going to be interesting combinations that you can sort of find and work your way around there. I don't think that there's anything that's quite as interesting as unlimited turrets, um, but it is still a pretty solid combination here. Celestian, I think that this is one of the more fun ways to play Syndicate. To a very limited degree, the Lightbringer does make up for some of the uh, downfalls of the Syndicate because it is a fairly powerful early game unit, but it's not an overpoweringly uh, powerful early game unit. It's just really, uh, if you get it into a good position, it's capable of thwacking its way straight through the enemies and uh, crushing them pretty effectively, and some of the early game Celestian mods are really powerful. Um, hard to counter in the early game, but uh, I, I don't necessarily know if it's quite enough to drag them out of their early game funk, because I do think that Syndicate still is one of the weaker early game armies. Um, late game though, the combination of uh, the extra influence as well as the fact that you're probably going to actually have incentive to take skilled diplomat means that you could be getting a good economy rolling while still having that uh, downside that Syndicate have of not being able to properly um, uh, save up for the the late game uh, ascended teachers without the sort of bonuses like they're pretty good at saving up for them even though they're going to be pressed really hard in the early game um, I do think as well that their access to the psionic tree gives them really nice synergy with the uh, the ascended teacher as well as the star guide those units are capable of getting those bonuses and since the uh, psionic tree has a lot of psionic buff related things. You're not doing this for damage, you're going to the Psionic Tree so you can gain access to those really powerful buffs, making them even more capable of boosting up your units as they sort of are going through. Uh, I think that uh, the one issue here is that you are going to still want to have indentured in your forces because they're cheap and they're easy to manufacture lots of if you need something, and Lightbringers are not a good core unit because they can't fire upwards. You can use Star Guides uh, in substantial numbers if you really are struggling with air, but um, Typically speaking, you're going to need something a little bit cheaper to deal with that in some instances. Um, and the indentured can't gain benefits from the Celestian bonuses, which is really unfortunate. Um, other than that, though, it's a pretty fun combination. I do think that it's pretty good. I do think that the uh, Vanguard version is stronger. Uh, Jetpacks is just ridiculously overpowered, as well as the uh, bonuses on their Lightbringer in the early game are stronger. But Celestian Syndicate has a really powerful uh, late game sort of synergy sort of going for it that you can sort of uh, uh, manage to crush people with. Next up is Void Tech. I think that Syndicate Void Tech is one of the ones that you would only consider if you're playing against real people, and I have not tested this. Uh, against the legendary AI, the bonuses that uh, Syndicate Void Tech have don't really seem to come into play. The Echo Walker is the most default of all Echo Walkers in the game. The only difference that they sort of provide is that they are capable of uh, being concealed on the campaign map. They've got universal camouflage. And this is sort of a, an issue in a couple of ways. For one thing, this is not a combat bonus, so your Echo Walkers are just not necessarily as strong as ones that have those strong bonuses from other factions, uh, especially ones like, say, the... Um, Amazon one or the Devar one I think are really really good with the way that they their mechanics work But also the base Kirko abilities or the base assembly abilities are also really strong for the Echo Walker So I think that they run into this issue where their unit just is not as good as anyone else's um, And a lot of the abilities that you sort of get from this combination only really seem to help if you were theoretically against a real player I don't think that any of their units really sort of provide an overwhelming advantage for Syndicate um, by comparison to like anyone else. Like if I was playing Void Tech, I would pick anyone above Syndicate in this particular instance, just because nothing that they have seems to provide better synergy than uh, playing a different faction there. Um, there is theoretically some in the fact that you could get an arc-based air unit that's capable of using those arc weapons, but I don't think that's really enough to really justify this. Next up we have access to the Xenoplague. Xenoplague runs into the issue that it's not really a great combination with the Syndicate. There's not a ton of things that really uh, stand out as being useful for it. It plays like Xenoplague does, 
get lots of pustules. If you don't get a lot of pustules, you're screwed. If you do get a lot of pustules, you snowball. Um, and your your basic units are what you are actually building, but they don't really benefit too much from Xenoplague because these Xenoplague mods are not very good on normal units. Um, so you end up in a weird situation again with Xenoplague where it does its own thing and your faction has nothing to do with it. Um, in this particular case as well, I think it runs into the problem that Syndicate units kind of are weaker on their own. Um, and rely more heavily on their sort of uh, other influences. So Xenoplague being a bit weak is is a, even uh, more of a problem for them than normal. Sign number is interesting. It is sort of the ultimate in late game bonuses. If they had a different type of initiate, they would probably be really good. The problem here is that they gain nothing that is useful in the early game, and you're going to be building lots and lots of indentured. Indentured are pretty okay. There's nothing inherently terrible about them, but they're not a great unit. Um, and if your opponent is spamming out their tier 1 inversion, they're probably going to be able to defeat your indentured just because most of those other sorts of units get better mods earlier and are stronger. Um, so you're going to run into some issues in the early game with this particular combination, but once it gets rolling with a bunch of Malictors or being able to build initiates and put them in with full stacks of um, uh, indentured, this is when this sort of ball starts getting rolling and you end up being a tremendous late game threat because those initiates are going to hit hard enough to justify the fact that they've only got the one shot uh, shotgun sort of style there. And you're going to be able to deal enough damage as you sort of go through this that you're going to be able to just steamroll any sort of stack that comes near you. Malikers for this faction are just absolutely uh, ridiculous. Um, I do think though that um, if you're against the uh, very, very difficult AI, uh, this is one that you're going to consistently be able to get there. I'm not sure if you would be able to against a real person because they might rush you down. Hard to tell. Anyway, uh, next up we've got, uh, yeah, that's actually all of them. So anyway, let's go ahead into a game here. This one's actually not a finished one, but uh, we can talk about their tech tree and their units a little bit. Now. The next faction that I'm going to be playing, um, we're again not going to go through every single of the secret technologies. I just don't think that there's a tremendous amount of use to that uh, when there's a couple that I just don't think are that beneficial or that unique to them. Now that being said, I am planning on playing the Amazons for around my next playthrough and looking at the way their roster works, they actually get a lot of really unique secret tech units. So I might skip over Heritor but I'll probably play the rest of them. The reason, of course, being that Heritor plays broadly, as far as I can tell, the same for every faction there. So anyway, uh, first of all, we've seen Noble Diplomats and we've seen uh, Indentured Contracts before. If you're playing a game that has a lot of Indentured, you're playing something like, say, Sinumbra sort of build there, or you're playing with the Prometheans, um, or anything else that you decide to go for that route there, like hey, you go for Synthesis and you're going for a lot of uh, just cheap Indentured filled out with Electric Attacks and a bunch of the really powerful uh, Synthesis mods, uh, you're going to want to go for indentured contracts. It's a huge decrease in how much you're going to be both paying to get those units as well as how much you're upkeeping. And upkeep in this game is an absolute monster in terms of how much you end up spending on it. Being able to reduce like everything from the really early game in half in terms of cost lets you have large armies pretty quickly and also still gain a little bit of an income going. Or you could use it when you still have a smaller army and use this as a way to sort of boost up your economy because you won't be paying as much, you'll be uh, saving quite a lot of money off of that one. Uh, the other one here, this is a fairly weak bonus in my opinion. Um, it again is providing energy, but you're not really getting a great scaling rate on Noble Diplomats. There are certain instances where, where on easier campaigns it's going to be easier to uh, get a bunch of peace. Uh, agreements and stuff like that so you're going to wind up in a situation where this is stronger against certain difficulties but it's almost impossible for me to get those on the hardest difficulty. Um, similarly it's unlikely that people are going to give you these uh, free dollars if you're playing against real people knowing that your syndicate maybe if they don't know that that's something that you can get uh, they they won't bother but um, if you're playing against someone who knows what they're doing they probably aren't going to give you a bunch of free money. So next up we get access to the clandestine practices and this runs into a similar problem. If you're on easier difficulties or you're against real people, this is going to be fine, but on the hardest difficulty I find that even with Cloak and Dagger, even with the general ability that increases your covert operation uh, offense and all of the sort of uh, uh, operation bonuses from uh, operational prowess and stuff like that, you're, I tend to find that the AI is still immune to my operations. It, like I click over a city and it says their operational defense is too high for me to perform this operation. So 
that's a problem. The defense one is a little bit more justifiable in that they will sometimes still fail their operations against me. Um, but I've never gotten a colony to where I, I'm pretty sure they're actually immune to enemy operations because I've had people using operations on me no matter how high I've gotten it. So um, clandestine practices is kind of a weird tech in that I, th I think it's very much difficulty dependent. If you've given the AI a bunch of advantages that uh, seem to do something against this, uh, it seems like they are capable of just uh, tanking their way through this even if you've uh, you've focused heavily on it, so I wouldn't bother. Um, the, however, operations are extremely powerful in increasing your chances of succeeding with them in instances where that's something that's important. It's really, really strong, so you are going to want to take these in situations where it, it's viable. Um, similar sort of problem with the Intelligence Gathering Bureau. This would be useful against real players, especially the true site on the colony, um, especially if you've boosted up the, um, the scanning, if you uh, want that sort of thing there. Although, admittedly, this colony scan range uh, automatically gives you that as well, so I don't know what the hell the point of this really is. But uh, th th this building's a little bit more useful if you're playing against real people than when you're playing against the AI. Um, last of all, of course, you get access to the indentured servitude. This one's really strong, but you get it so late in the game that this by then is more of a catch-up mechanic than it is an outright good production bonus. A good production bonus should have been like churning out extra stuff throughout the entire game, ideally. Um, the bonuses that you get as the Vanguard, for example, Devar bonuses as well are much much better than this one even though they're smaller because this one's going to be coming in very very late in the game and cost you a lot of technology points to get it you're going to be suffering a lot if you sort of try to beeline to it so I do think that this one's in a weird place but it does sort of emphasize that really powerful snowball effect of getting into the late game as Syndicate once you get access to this sort of stuff you're going to be able to sort of crush people um, deep infiltration, this is a lot of extra damage, but I find it hard to, again, to use these sort of operations just because of the difficulty I play at. If you're playing against real people, this is going to be almost guaranteed and it's going to be a very, very powerful bonus for you. And if you're playing against easier AIs, this is also a, a lot of extra damage for relatively inexpensive, uh, uh, in a relatively inexpensive kind of way there. For military, we can take a look at their uh, core units first, actually. Let's skip over all this for a second here. So, first of all, we get access to the Enforcer. This is actually one of the best melee units in the game. They're naturally stagger resistant, which is more important for melee units than it is for ranged units uh, that are not snipers. The Cytex Shield is a very, very powerful defensive measure. It goes for plus four shields, which is more than shields up as a defensive move, as well as giving you that sort of adjacent bonus to anything that sort of decided to sit near you. Now, this does mean that your blob could be extremely vulnerable to area of effect attacks, and if you're getting shredded by concussive shells, your stagger resistance is out the window, and you're probably going to be like just in a lot of trouble because everyone was clumped up. But under certain circumstances, this could be extremely powerful, and when you're not in those circumstances, this is still substantially better than standard defense for advancing these guys into the enemy. And the fact that this thing bypasses shields and armor and has a high strength value, all of that combined makes this a really, really powerful melee unit, one of the best ones in the game. The only problem is that the army doesn't really focus around these guys that effectively, and they don't have the best mods for them, so you are looking to try and get... Um, tech combos that are capable of giving these guys a little bit more punch. Uh, Bone Crusher as well means that unlike a lot of melee units, these guys are capable of firing into the air. They're still capable of uh, ignoring that armor. And uh, Crippled is not the best of the um, uh, status effects that you can apply. Stagger is pretty nice there. Uh, it's just all around a fair, fairly strong, uh, powerful unit there. Um, I don't necessarily build as many as I'd like of these just because I'm trying out uh, the, fact, uh, the secret technology specific ones, but I would definitely highly recommend that these guys are a good unit. The Overseer is a very dedicated indentured support unit. There's not a ton of point in having a lot of these guys around if you're going to be going for uh, non-indentured units. The reason is that Cytec Revitalization is a pretty standard heal that you're going to get on a lot of factions. Uh, most factions have something that can heal in a sort of similar way of this in, in, in one of their support units, but Cerebral Override only works if you're playing with a, a bunch of indentured, or at least one indentured, um, and that kind of sucks. Uh, it's 
It's a powerful ability so long as you stacked enough uh, offensive abilities onto those indentured to make it worthwhile to cerebral override them. And the fact that they're unkillable for that round means that you could hypothetically have like a bunch of uh, overseers chain overriding one unit as they are just literally at death store for the entire game. Um, that would be potentially really funny. Their own attack is decent enough though that a lot of the time it's actually okay to just fire with them. They're, they're, they're not terrible at combat in their own sort of right there. They're not great at it either, but it's pretty okay. Imposed Discipline is a pretty good uh, critical bonus in the early game. There's not many people that have a decent critical bonus in the early game. Um, so it can add to that if you're sort of going for waves of indentured. Next up we've got access to the runner. As a scout goes, this one's pretty nice simply because it is universally camouflage. This means that it's capable of getting out there uh, doing its thing without opening up the diplomacy tab and on this difficulty that's really nice because it means that the AI is much more likely to get into wars with other neighbors that it is aware exist and by the time that it knows that you do exist it's much less likely to care because it's already entrenched in this sort of terrible war against its neighbor letting you sort of expand more freely towards those guys or wherever you need to. Uh, they're Actual damage in the way they fight is not really fantastic or anything like that, and I'd say that the Arc Bolas is a pretty mediocre form of support from these guys, but it is single action, and there are instances where it's quite nice, especially locking down something like a melee unit. Uh, the Arc Bolas can be really, really good for that, but all in all, I don't really think that these are a combat unit of any sort. You just use them for scouting. Next up we get the indentured, and these guys run into some weird issues. For one thing, um, since they are your primary form of damage dealing, the fact that their arc damage is kind of bad. The reason is that arc can't be switched from the channeled into any, other, uh, any of the other ones. And the reason that this is a bad thing is that if you're playing against something like, say, the Amazons who can get the grounding harness really early, they can completely shut off the damage that your indentured are doing. Now, if they had a different damage type, like let's say that the indentured were a psionic unit and the uh, hypothetical Amazons had a uh, anti-psionic harness instead, um, you could switch that psionic damage out for um, flame damage, for energy damage. And if they were resistant to both of those, you could switch it out to bio damage, um, which means that you've got a lot more versatility for bypassing the defenses that your opponent is taking making it so that they can't build their defenses around you to make themselves invulnerable against your damage type. By contrast, when they've only got this one sort of a thing, anyone that's capable of sniping grounding harnesses can really screw you over. There's also a bunch of unit types that are resistant to arc, and people can sort of focus on purchasing those sorts of units to make sure that their army is more resilient against you. So there are some really serious in, um, impediments to using the indentured as your core unit. That being said though, um, the cerebral control color is, is situationally useful, like if you're up, up against Celestials, because they'll probably be stripping your morale down to like minus nine million or whatever, but these guys are going to be perfectly fine with that because they don't have morale penalties. Um, they're also decently psionically resistant, which makes it so that uh, they can resist a few things out there, but not very many in the early game. Uh, ultimately, the indentured, I think, are a fairly okay unit with some very fringe weaknesses that are pretty crippling in the circumstances where they come up, but other than that, there's nothing too bad about them. They've got Overwatch, they've got the ability to deal decent damage, Arc Power Blast is inferior to grenades and stuff like that, but it's still not the worst in the world there, and their prime rank range uh, bonus is actually really, really nice. Being able to have an extra point of range on any unit is always going to make them far more functional. So anyway, that is all of the non-research units for the uh, these guys here. Let's go ahead and take a look at all of their research tree. So start. We'll, we'll start with our units here. So the Guild Assassin, this is a unit that has a lot of, of, of interesting potential there. Because of the Breach round, it's capable of bypassing 5 points of shield, 5 points of armor. Um, this means that in, in the late game, even if someone has built something with a grounding harness, for example, they are capable of punching through a lot of the defense. Even though they can't punch through that static defense there, that arc defense, they are going to be punching through that armor and shield, which means that on average, they're probably going to be leveling out quite nicely. Um, I do find, however, that it is tricky to use their... Um, superior overwatch effectively. The reason is that if you're going to be firing at uh, units with these guys, if you opt to try and use superior overwatch, even against the AI, there's a lot of instances where these guys get staggered, which means that you're not going to get that overwatch shot, which means that you lose that extra damage and you lose your base damage 
because of this, if there's any chance at all that they can stagger your snipers, you're going to want to make sure that you fire rather than using that uh, superior overwatch, which is really unfortunate. Um, I do think that they're not necessarily the best sniper in the game there, but they are pretty decent for what they are and what they do. Uh, I think that uh, one of the nicest things about these guys is that they will almost always hit thanks to the way the tech tree is structured for the uh, syn uh, syndicate. Next up is force projection with the Mirage here. The Mirage is not my favorite of units. There are people I've, I've heard that say that this is a good unit and I, I can understand sort of why it would be okay. Hallucination projection is actually is, is really quite strong and the defense uh, mode Mirage shield is also quite strong. The combination of these can make it so that your army is very, very difficult to deal with in a certain respect there. And I can understand that this is more of a defensive type unit, but it's a very squishy defensive type unit, defending other units quite well and making the enemy disrupted, but it itself can be blown out of the sky really quite easily. So I have a hard time placing uh, the Mirage as a unit there. Uh, next up you get access to the Wrath. I think this is one of the better tanks in terms of the late game, again because of that scaling um, and ability to punch through enemy scaling. It doesn't matter how much shields my opponent stacks up there, or armor rather, sorry, um, that my opponent stacks up there, I'm still going to be punch punching straight through that with the Cytec Cannon. Now, since I can also give these units um, some level of uh, different uh, type of damage. They're also going to be ignoring that psionic resistance that a lot of vehicles have in the late game. So you're not going to have any problem with that. Uh, it's just an all around pretty powerful tank here. Shields up, pretty okay form of defense there. Uh, psionic resistance, for stag resistance. Uh, lots, lots of the sort of standard stuff you would expect to see in the tank here. Now what is weird is the wreath drive. This is a powerful ability in a certain sense, but it's hard to use very effectively. I find that there's lots of instances where this is not the most optimal choice and you just want to do it anyway. Um, I think that this would probably actually be really good if it's staggered units, but as it is, it's a, it's a situationally sort of a okay ability. I do think that there are instances where I would like to use it. Uh, the side deck blast, on the other hand, very, very difficult to find a good justification for using this just because it's a full action um, and people would have to walk like themselves into your cone of fire when realistically more of the times you're going to be using the SciTech cannon. All right. Next up, we have access to the these guys, the subjugators. These guys on paper are okay, but there are so many ways to get better forms of... Um, better forms of mind control that you don't really need to take these guys. They're very expensive for what they do. Uh, the project agony field for what it is, that kind of large large artillery strike kind of thing there, is really weak compared to other things of, of its tier, like a Herod or High Lord just blows this thing out of the water. Um, it's, it's kind of a weird unit because of that. I don't necessarily know what this is really for there. The activate reanimation callers can be okay, but you don't really care that much about an indentured unit, like bringing back one indentured unit is pretty weird uh, as a limitation for a unit this expensive. Um, it's weapons as well, like I would rather have just the tank. It, it would be way better to just have a tank there. Next up you have access to the Zenith, and this thing is really quite powerful but very expensive. One of the other problems with this thing is that it does have a bit of negative synergy here. Uh, you are probably going to be taking this when you're going for an indentured uh, heavy strategy there. Um, but unfortunately it gives you that plus 200 morale, so you are going to have to find other uses for it other than indentured builds there. Um, and while you could theoretically be doing something else, uh, this thing, uh, since it's got sort of like reinforcement zone, you're going to be focusing on biological and cyborg units. So you're looking at guild assassins and you're looking at enforcers primarily and overseers. Um, so I'm not necessarily sure what this is for because those are not your best um, mainline infantry. You could just use this with a bunch of enforcers, I suppose, use the house anthem to pop those. But I'm not necessarily convinced that that's your best use of your resources. Just this expensive is a bit too much there. Uh, I would generally only use this if I was so far into the game that I could not cram more utility and more power into a stack without putting these in there, but it would be pretty rare for this to be more powerful than other units that I could have access to, such as the Herod or High Lord. I think is more powerful than this in a lot of ways, um, and I think that something like, say, the... Um, uh, the Ascended Teacher is more powerful than this sort of thing. So yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think this is a great sort of unit there, but it's, it's something you can take. 
All right, so next up we have access to their um, operations here. So sensor infiltration, um, I don't find this to be too, too useful. Um, it would be probably, again, more useful against real people, but what really makes this okay is that it is fairly inexpensive, so you can use it pretty quickly and pretty cheaply. Uh, there's the emergency cloaking field. Uh, again, I think this would be useful against real people. Uh, I don't find it overly useful against the AI, um, and I have no sort of way of, uh, I, I haven't played against real people, so I can't say for sure how good that would be there. The Pulse Beam Cannon is, again, better against real people, but at least it does have that sort of baseline 20% damage that you typically see on these sort of operations. It's weaker than a lot of other ones because the secondary effect is not like more damage or not defeating that enemy, but there are certain things that can uh, make this really quite okay. Um, next up you have access to industrial sabotage. Uh, I, I tend to find, again, the AI produces things without actually referencing any sort of real numbers, so this would not necessarily be that good. Um, I don't think that I've ever seen them go into unrest either, so I don't necessarily think it would be that important there. Uh, Bread and Circuses, this one's actually quite fantastic. Gaining uh, more from those happiness events means you can go for a weird strategy where you're really focusing down that happiness tree so long as you've got the secret tech for it. And you end up in a situation where you're just absolutely churning out a ton of random resources every turn. It's really, really powerful. Um, the problem is that people tend to sort of target this down and get rid of your bread and circuses as fast as possible just because of how powerful it is there. And next up, we got access to their text, uh, actual text here. Um, so exploitative targeting system is really quite decent. This is one of the better ones. The problem is that like while it is really good in the early game and is pretty okay mid-late game, it's not a late game tech obviously, so it's not gonna be the most powerful thing you can slap on a unit usually. It's gonna be outclassed by a lot of other things, but you're gonna be stuck late game in a lot of instances looking at this and being like, I really wish there was a better high tier uh, syndicate thing that I could put on whatever unit you're talking about there. Um, plus 20% accuracy is what this makes this thing really, really stand out. There's just tons of instances where I want a unit to have that extra accuracy, and the fact that this is such a big chunk of it really makes it quite decent. Uh, over here you get access to the Tactical Advantage Protocol. This one's kind of garbage. I don't really uh, find that you really need that very often. It is a good way to get a single unit a lot more extra damage, but there are other units uh, or other things I would much rather prefer using. Um, the SciTech Vision Enhancer, this is actually a really, really powerful mod. The 10% accuracy is nice, but more important is that it's plus two to your shields rather than just plus one for a very cheap mod. Again, it runs into the problem that in the very, very late game, you're not scaling up too well with this thing, but it's competitive. It's going to be able to keep up with other sort of later tier techs uh, to a certain degree. A cerebral control collar, um, this turns your unit into an indentured one. There's a lot of instances where I find that I have got good morale effects, so this is a bit of a negative in those instances, and obviously there's a limit to what sort of units you can put this on. Um, I would much rather be able to put uh, other sorts of modifications on whatever units I'm indenturing, so this is only if I've really sort of got a good setup for my overseers to boost up those indentured units, which typically I will if I'm going for that sort of route. Um, this also opens up some really weird and interesting combos Combination. So I do think this is a pretty powerful tech. Uh, Diversion Projector is actually a really cheap, really effective, really good tactical operation. Um, just being able to instantly blind a bunch of units really screws over your opponent's uh, ability to fend off and attack or, or do whatever. Um, I think that this one being uh, one operation point cost makes it really, really powerful. Next up we have access to Spatial Acceleration Sails. This one only applies to the Mirage, it gives it fast movement speed and makes them become hard to hit while they're defending, which means that you're sort of more so encouraged to stand above your army while using the defensive stance over and over and over again. Um, I, I don't really understand this sort of combination of the Mirage as a unit in general there, but you could definitely make it just super tanky and just have it do nothing but zip around defending other units, I guess. I'm not really sure I find it that useful. Deploy Sentinel is a way to get a unit on the field, but if you're comparing it to something like Deploy Valkyrie, it's so much weaker than deploying a Valkyrie. Next up, we have access to the, um, the Control Amplifier. This is one of the things that makes it so that your indentured are powerful. If you're going indentured, you're going to get this, and it's going to be a big boost to all of them. Um, it's basically equivalent of putting one mod on one unit and getting um, a free tier one, I'd say, mod on like your other five units there. So it's it's actually really quite decent. And technically speaking, you can use this on more than just the uh, five indentured that would be in the stack with the overseer. Technically, this can also be done on other stacks, as far as I'm aware. 
Uh, next up is Adaptive Camouflage Projector. Universal Camouflage, again, I think is more useful against the AI, uh, or against real people than it is against the AI. Um, the 15% harder to hit, kind of okay, and the, what's really nice about this is the Evasion Defense Bonus instead. It means that you're capable of moving up certain types of units while making them incredibly difficult to hit, but a lot of good melee type units already have specialized defense type modes or specialized gap closers or whatever, so I, I don't necessarily know when you would use the adaptive camouflage projector. I haven't found a great use for it yet, but I'm sure there's one out there. It seems like it's got promise to it. <coughs> oh man, my voice is just going here. Next up is the advanced dislocation drive. This one's a bit of a... Um, kind of a meme sort of thing here. It's not really necessarily the most effective. Um, it's capable of dealing um, a decent amount of damage, uh, but more important is that uh, you're basically invulnerable once you use this, like the extra 40% harder to hit for one turn after you teleport. The extra shields, the fact that you've got shields up on those tanks, all of that really makes the advanced dislocation drive really, really effective at letting you relocate your tank and having it survive afterwards. I just don't necessarily think that this is the best use of one of your mod slots. Next up is the Cytex Cerebral Execution. Chance to instantly kill a unit. Um, I do think this one's kind of okay. It's not necessarily my sort of favorite thing there because it can only target the biological or cyborg non-commander units. Um, and those are units that do not necessarily um, need to be executed with a really expensive kind of thing here. Lastly, we get access to the Cerebral Amplifier. Um, I don't think that the secondary effect of this is very good, but what you're really doing with this one is going for the uh, unit and all indentured units in the army gain plus 25% critical chance. The critical chance is quite nice there, that's actually quite a large amount of it, and crits in this game are just really, really powerful. So, uh, the fact that purging protocols is kind of mediocre, like the fact that you can only use it on, on indentured, like, the thing is that this is actually not that bad, because the cooldown comes up quite nicely, but the fact that it's only one unit and it has to be an indentured one means it's not very flexible. The reason that this is kind of decent is that by the time you're in this late game, your indentured are probably going to be in constant like lockdown with some sort of concussive thing or they're on fire or they've been electrified. So this is useful in that sort of sense that you can constantly get rid of those things. But you're mainly go going for the plus 25% critical hit chance and you're mainly doing this on one unit like your overseer probably in situations where you're going to be building indentured heavy armies. Next up, you have access to the SciTech Drive Modulator. Stagger immunity on heavy units for this faction is kind of nice. Um, since they don't have a ton of other options for that, it would be nicer if they didn't have to apply this to heavy units, so you could put it on your snipers or something like that. But um, the ability to use an ability and heal for 10 points and gain plus 15% damage uh, for three turns, this is actually a really good one to put on characters if they're in a tank, which is a probably the best way to use this in my opinion. Um, it's a pretty beefy ability and it does a lot of different things too. I, I do think that this one's quite good. The problem with it is that there's not too many units that can make a great use of it. Um, if you've got like full round action abilities it's just not necessarily the strongest thing in the world there. So anyway that is the entire tech tree and all of the combinations for the syndicate. Oh there is one more thing I should be mentioning here. So the problem with the Syndicate as well is that the Psionic Tree is not their damage tree. Uh, their units that primarily deal damage primarily uh, are arc weapon systems. Psionic as your supports is actually quite nice still because it does have things like the Mantra of Clarity, it does have things like the Mantra of Healing, and or Mantra of Life, and those are things that your Overseers, for example, are capable of making really good use of, because they've got those Psionic buffs there, they're capable of then stacking on other Psionic buffs. The problem is that your Overseer, if you're going for an Overseer-focused strategy, probably is dealing with a bunch of indentured, so you're probably actually going to want to have access to the Cerebral... Um, the cerebral boosters here, like the cerebral amplifier and the uh, control amplifier, which means you've only got enough room for either the mantra of life or the mantra of clarity, and you're probably actually going to want to do something else instead in any event, because neither of those are great for defense. Although you could just go for one of them, I guess, but um, yeah, it, it runs in that sort of weird situation. There was not a ton in here that you really need to to get access to, and your damage dealers are not going to benefit a ton from it. Um, the reason that, I, that that's a problem, I sort of got distracted, is that this is where you get the ability to switch out your damage types. And whatever has a more versatile damage type 
is probably the one you want on your main damage dealers. You can bypass this by going for Covert Offensive for the Wrath uh, or Wraith or whatever, and those are capable of switching out their damage type and dealing a bunch of damage, but I don't necessarily think that that uh, is the easiest way to play the game, simply because by the time you get those going up and running, uh, they're a little bit expensive to get access to, so you're going to be ramping into that very, very slowly, and you're going to be really vulnerable in the early game. Now, Arc for a non-damaging type of uh, school here is actually pretty powerful, and you can eventually get to a position where you're going to be doing okay with it. Um, the static buildup module is necessary if you're up against a ton of Arc resistance, but the duration of it is so low that I just don't necessarily think that you're going to get a ton of benefit out of this, because in any other sort of situation, like the way it works is you get static buildup on the target by firing at it with a bunch of like your indentured or whatever, and then you finish it off because that last indentured that's firing at them is capable of dealing a bunch of damage through their reduced arc defense. But if you're playing a different faction, you would have switched out your weapons to a different energy type and you would have just done full damage from the get-go. And you probably would have killed them before you killed them using static buildup. So it's not really a great sort of a, a mod there. However, arc retaliation defense is really strong. Uh, there's a great... It, it's got a great sort of bonus to it. It really shuts down melee builds. Uh, it's just quite decent. I think that this is one of the better mods out there and more versatile since it does not have to be applied to your arc units. So I do think that the arc retaliation defense sort of uh, helps this out. Again, not an offensive one though. Um, Next up, you have the Arc Impact Module. Considering where this is in the tech tree, this is really weird. It's quite weak for where it is. Uh, by now, you would hope that you're getting something much, much stronger than that. And then suddenly it jumps up to like the next tier from Staggered, and you're looking at the Stun Module as well as the Chain Module, uh, the Arc Extension Module. And both of those are ridiculously powerful, so you're looking at a situation where... Um, you go from basically nothing um, for the first tier, and then you go to the next one at a, a much higher tier here, and you get a really good thing, and then you get nothing for a long time, and then you get really good things, and then you get nothing. It's it's kind of a weird tech tree. Um, so yeah, the stun module, very, very powerful combined with that arc extension module, you're going to make it so that a lot of opponents just can't do anything, and you can eventually chip away things that are fairly resistant, just because you can focus your fire until something's stunned, and since it's jumping to other people, you're going to be still doing fine amounts of uh, uh, stun chance. And then you can sort of go to the last tech here, and Positron Arc Storm Projector, I've never found a good use for this thing. Theoretically, like, being able to jump in somewhere and getting a big cone of, like... Uh, uh, stuns off would be good, but I I, I have not found a good way made uh, a good way to make this thing tremendously useful. Just because it's a full action there, so you're not going to be running in and doing it. You're going to be walking in slowly and probably getting killed or they scattered before you could use it. Uh, next up is the Positron Discharge Shield. Anything that can use this, I don't really feel like should be anywhere near where the Arc Discharge or Positron Discharge Shield could be used. Um, and it's less consistently good than uh, something like, say, the Arc Retaliation Defense. Now, the fact that this does make you 25% harder to hit with ranged attacks can actually be fairly decent. This is an instance where if you're like using this sort of thing, um, and advancing on the enemy while using, say, the camouflage for that uh, evasion type defense there, as well as being 15% harder to hit, and maybe your syndicate, so you've got an extra 15 or, or actually 20% from the Guardian Demon Shell, you're looking at a situation where you're pretty much impossible to hit as you walk up to them, and if they do decide to melee you, then this thing procs. But the units that can use this thing are like your indentured and your guild assassin, and you don't want those to be close to your enemy, so you would rather play around not letting that happen. Um, I suppose that you would take this that if you're in a shootout, you get access to that 25% harder to hit with ranged attacks, but I, I'm still not entirely convinced that the Positron Discharge Shield is all that useful. Um, maybe if you're in the extreme late game and you just need to have more expensive, more powerful defensive modules, this is certainly more powerful as a defense module than some, any of the other ones that you'd be getting. But it's a really weird one. It's a top tier arc one and it's a defensive module rather than an offensive one. So anyway, that's everything I've got to talk about here. So I hope you found this episode enjoyable. And of course, as always, hope to see you guys all next time.